Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi there. Hello. Hi. This is an interview that we're conducting to talk about the godfather of Scar himself, the fantastic, the great Laura Aitken. And the people that are gathered here today and that are sharing in this all intimately have very close association with the late, great Laura Aitken. And I'm going to introduce everybody by turn. I'm going to start with the person that knew Laurel the longest time. Uh, and that's Mr. Roy Ellis, who's checking in from Switzerland. So would you like to say hello, Roy? Hi, man. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Roy. <laughs> Next, from Switzerland, we're going to move to France. Um, I've got to talk to Stan Samuel. Who Hi. It's a very long time close associate of Laurel from the 80s, 90s, uh, uh, probably even more than any of us know. And uh, Stan's coming in from France, so do stay. Hello, Stan. Bonjour. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hope you're all good. Uh, merci beaucoup. Um, next, I'm going to talk to two other people who played with Laurel uh, for a long time. Um, I'm going to start with Mr. Drew Stansel, who's um, phoning in from Leicester. Uh, say hi, Drew. Hello, everybody. Good to, good to um, see you all and talk to you all. And uh, next, I've got from West London, because this band is has uh, got all bases covered, uh, the wonderful Steve Harris, the headmaster himself. Uh, you say hello, Steve, and say hi to everybody. Oh, technology. Steve's disappeared. Oh, it, 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 Steve is gone again. Oh, uh, well, uh, well, we'll see what we can do about that. But, uh, and, uh, to tick, let's see if we can add Steve. He's having problems with his dog and his technology. I think he's, uh, I think yeah, he's, he's back. in live from West London. Is he back? Yeah, he's back. I haven't seen him yet. I haven't seen him. I, see I can him. see Mark now. Oh, oh I can see Roy now. Um, I was just introducing you to the good people and inviting you to say hello to everybody. But he's frozen. No, he's, I think he's he's concentrating. Because I'm changing what to say. Okay, well, finally, uh, I'm I'm Mark Wyeth, and um, I've been looking after Laurel's affairs for a long time, uh, but also uh, in his lifetime as well. Anyway, so today we're asked to discuss um, uh, about the great Laurel because Cherry Red Records are going to have a month of focus on Laurel and his uh, catalogue, which has been in, with them for a very long time, and. Um, should we just have a little burst of music? Um, we're going to start with Freedom Train by Laurel. We just have a few seconds of this, I think. could it freedom that's all we need laurel knew it then. we know it now what a bust in tune and so to kick off the conversations as we've established that uh, roy knew the great man uh longer than all of us and has had a very intimate part uh, of his life uh over to you roy um share with us your thoughts about laurel and your personal history with him and anything else comes to mind that you well, want to say. It, um, what can I say? I mean, I knew Laurel in 1964, something like this. Hmm. I was a very young guy. And at the time, 
it was uh, producing for um, uh, Meredith's Blue Beat record. And he was looking for a young band to back him at the time. And all there was a black band in London those days was just playing soul music. So he came to a rehearsal hall and we found us and then he spoke to us and said, would you like to have a band who doesn't want to play you no know, soul music? He wanted a band who can back him and play you know, this Latin sound and so on. We didn't want to do that beginning, but he tried to convince us and say, hey, it'd be good for you to try to play some, something else instead of playing ska music, whatever, you know. Anyway, you can be, you know, we get acquainted with him and uh, we start to do a little concert with him and, you know, and uh, it goes on like this over the years. Then he gets to like us very much. Then he produced us, made the first record. He produced Jesse James Rise Again and two other songs, Because I Love You and Shotgun and some other stuff. And then it goes on and goes on. Then we used to back him all over England, but in the black circle, not, with, not in the, uh, the white circle, you know? And he was the first black man who started to promote shows in big halls, as I said before, top rank, make a ballroom, civic halls, and all, all over the place, Birmingham, all over, all over England, we used to, you know, travel around with him. And uh, we used to back him. We used to have over 45 minutes as a, as a you know, supporting act. I had to come out and do my 45 minutes show and then come the great Lara. After, after a while, he stopped doing that and just started concentrating on promotion. And it goes on and we get acquainted with one a real good and, you know, got, you know, great, good relationship. And um, over the years, we just slowly slipped away and uh, we, we lost touch one another. But at the beginning, we was with him for about from 1965 65 until nine until 1960, 1966, 66, 1967, would be Larry. Uh, we just disappeared. He went from London to, to Birmingham, then from Birmingham he went to Leicester, that's all. And I met him again in 19, uh, 2005 or 2006 in Switzerland. But he didn't remember me at the beginning. But I when I told him where I was, he said, oh, you had a guy you used to play the trombone. Oh, you're right, to right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> but then, then, you know, so and he goes all right. But it's it not much to say because he was a, like, a decent person. He was very funny. He was a great guy to work with, very direct. Tell us straight if it's not good, it's not good, and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he was a great guy. What can I say about Larell? And without Larell, I would be here today because he wanted to discover me, uh, you know. Even he gave us the name, gave me the name Mr. Simmerip, and whatever. So I started to carry on with it with the scene because uh, we got a very great song out there, and it's a pity nobody not doing it. He's the one who was behind me all the way. So I gotta give gratitude to Larell. Without Larell, I wouldn't be here today. So what can I say? It's a great guy. It's a great guy for everybody. Everybody, when I spoke, I went to Japan, even the promoter talk about him. Maybe part of the world you go where, where Laurel performed, only positive thing you hear from him. I never, never heard of Laurel, anybody said to Laurel that he was a stupid guy, he was a whatever, you know, he's just a normal, down to earth, grounded person. That's all I can say. Laurel, in my eyes, is the godfather, and he would be a and he was a Jamaican, the first Jamaican icon. That was Laurel. It was long before Bob Marley, long before everybody else. In, when I was in Jamaica, uh, when he come with uh, Alton Ellis, with Alton and Eddie, and Larry Lakin, these are the two guys who was really getting down in Jamaica. Laurel got a lot of hits in the island. I mean, you know, those days it would never be a hit under the European because they didn't know him. But the island people like Barbados, Trinidad, uh, um, from uh, what's the other name? Of the All the islands, anyway. The English speaking island with some like Mary Lee, a bartender, Baba Kill Me Goat, and all those other stuff. That, that was it, was like a Bob Marley in Jamaica those days, you know. So, that everybody should take the hat off for Laurel because Laurel is the one who carried the Jamaican music mixed with Latin all the way until he died. So he deserved to have the name 
the Godfather of Ska. Although at the beginning he didn't play the song, but he, he was producing it, but he was he wasn't playing it, you know. Until later on when we left the country, then it takes over. When we went to come pioneer the music in Middle Europe, it takes over. But you have to give them the credit. He is the Jamaican icon long before Bob Marley and all the other guys, and you know. That's all I can say about him. It's, it's, Darryl is, what can I say? I would never give him five. I'd give him a hundred. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm going to turn to Stan. Because uh, Stan, you, you, you have such a long, long, long association as well. Like, like Roy. Maybe not back to the past. It, it, it's really funny listening to Roy speak. Because I was born in 1962. So I grew up listening to Lowell's music as a child. And what's so funny about Roy's story, if you fast forward 20 years to 1985, I was playing, I, 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 I'm a guitarist, but I joined this, I played keyboards on a gig once by mistake. And somebody saw me in the crowd and said, there's a young guy who plays keyboards. Can he get him in the band? They were just doing, they were, they were a club band. And I, I joined them, but in that, the drummer in that club band was my cousin, Sylvester Dow. And he said, I didn't know you played keyboards. And I said, oh, well, I can do. He said, well, Lowell, you know Lowell Aitken? And I said, what, the Lowell Aitken? And he said, yeah, 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 the Lowell Aitken. He says, he needs a keyboard player. And I said, well, yeah, but what do you mean, the? I said, do you play for him? He said, yeah. He said, come down to the rehearsal. Now, I walked into this rehearsal, and I knew, strangely enough, I knew the trumpeter, it was Tony Robinson, and... I knew the two guitarists, Clem Dublin and, Ke and Kerry Kemp. I knew them and John Southgate on bass. I remember thinking, and I said, oh, oh, I know, yeah, what's happening here? He said, oh, we play for Lowell Aitken. And, and I, I still said, what, the Lowell Aitken? Because in my head, I've got Lowell Aitken records at home. I don't know what we're doing in this dodgy rehearsal room in Leicester. And in, in comes Lowell. And I, I, I kind of work out, I can, it really is the Lowell Aiken. I, <laughs> I was a bit starstruck. <laughs> and uh, he came over to me and said, um, yeah, this one goes E flat, C minor. And I went A flat, B flat. And he went, oh, you know your cards. And I went, well, I know them ones. <laughs> All right. So, but I was a little bit mesmerized because the band was shocking. If I'm being totally honest, it was. I was like, I was kept thinking, how can this be the Lowell Aitken with these? I kept thinking in my mind, he would have had the best Jamaican artist um, players playing in, and I kept thinking, how how are we his band? Um, I learnt his set. He was quite surprised because I knew every single one of his songs, and I could play him without thinking. Um, but I kept saying to him, and I, I, when I look back, it might have been a little bit um, strange, but I kept saying to him, no, why, why are these people in your band? I can get better players. You deserve better players. <laughs> uh, and he said, do you know any? I said, well, I can get your horn section for a start. Um, and then I think, I think I, might, I, I persuaded him to change my, uh, change the drummer for Dave Anderson and we started it started being a, a quite a decent band and at that time the, the that low was kind of getting a load of little gigs like um Gaz's Rocking Blues um little Manchester gigs where we were gigging but we were kind of a high energy band and I kind of I kept thinking that this is low in my mind I kept thinking, this is Laurel Aitken. He deserves the best. And I kept thinking, let's not just roll up and be any band. Let's be a great band. Um, and I don't know why, but Lowell stopped start coming to the rehearsals. And, I, and he said, I don't need to come to the rehearsals, Stan. You make sure, you make sure that the band's tight and I'll just come and sing. And now, I mean, <clears throat> in hindsight, I should have said, no, it's your band. You do it. Um, but I was so honoured to be given that power and and it was it was so funny and then we just started gig we started doing international scar festivals it started all of a sudden snowballing into the uh i would say just before the i would say it was the end of the second wave i would say where we started 
getting great gigs, started going around Europe, going, you know, and I was the first person, first person that had taken me on a plane to do a gig. You know, it was kind of, you know, we, we just thought, and we got a great band together. And I would always say, I've done loads of things since, um, but I always say where it all started for me was Lowell going E flat, C minor, and me going A flat, B flat, because he just, he trusted me and it made, and it just led to other things, which is really strange. I'm glad Steve's back because that's how I met Steve. Lowell in his um, eternal wisdom, uh, one of the guitarists, well, the guitarist never turned up, obviously he's gone. Um, the guitarist didn't turn up for a gig, Clem Dublin, he didn't turn up and Freetown with a support band. And Lowell just went up to Steve and said, no, went and said, who's the guitarist? I think Steve said to me, he said, you're playing for me tonight. And I, I looked at Lowell and thought, oh, OK. Um, he said, Lowell says, you don't know the songs, but stand next to Stan and he'll talk you through it. They're really simple songs. And I spent the whole night going E, C, G to Steve. Steve, <laughs> Steve, it was like someone had, Steve was like the cat that got the cream because, you know, I, I, what happened to Steve that night was what I've dreamt of happening to me, going to see a band and someone say, come on and play with your, with your idol. Um, and I always envy Steve for that. I always think Steve went to play one day and ended up playing for his heroes and continued to play for them after that. That's, right. That's fantastic. And they, Stan, thank you. Um, so just, just to clarify two quick things if I can. When you became the governor of the backing band, yeah, did you rename them? Did you choose the name? Oh, I can tell you what happened with that. It's really funny. We were we were at gossips one night, um, and we were walking onto stage, and Gas said to me, "We played there before," and he said, "I can't. What's the name of the band?" I said, "We've not got a name." He said, "You got to have a name." As we were, I said, "I don't know." He said, "I can't. You just can't say Lowell Aitken and his band." And at the time, he was playing landlords and tenants. And he said, you called the pressure tenants. And that's literally what happened. <laughs> and that's literally how we got the name. That's fantastic. And, um, and how long did you play with Lowell? On, on um, for the strangest them? thing, I started playing with him in 85. And I left, not under a cloud. What happened was we supported Desmond Decker in Ireland. And uh, Desmond Decker's management poached me from. They um, they asked me to join their band, and it um, which for me was you know that was another level for me. But in a way, Lowell was quite upset with it. When I look back, and I understand why, because um, he felt that I'd used him as a stepping stone to something else, and he was he was the one that brought me in. And how could I leave him? And I understand that. Um, so for about six months. Um, I was with Desmond, and oh, then then slowly Lowell would get. Me. If I wasn't with, if I wasn't working with Desmond, Lowell Lowell would phone you up and go, um, he'd go Stan, and, uh, or he'd say like this, I'm gonna phone you tomorrow. At that time, I had a mobile phone, he, but he used to call it my walking phone. You have your walking phone? And I say, yeah, yeah. Said, I'm gonna phone you tomorrow. I said, what for? I said, have you got a gig? And he'd go, uh, yes, and no. <laughs> I said, well, it's happening. I'll phone you tomorrow. Didn't phone for a week. And then he'd, he'd say, what are you doing tonight? I said, why? He said, we've got a gig in London. And I'd go, yeah, I'll do it. And it's really funny. Low was one of two people that I would, wouldn't ask any questions about how much we were getting paid or where the gig was. If Lowell said we had a gig, if, if Lowell could come back today and say to me, Stan, we got a gig in wherever tomorrow, I'd go on the gig, and if we got paid, we got paid. Because for me, it wasn't anything to do with the money, nothing at all. I was so honoured to play for Lowell Aitken. It was, um, you know, but, but nearly, but not as honoured as my mum and dad. They thought, I was, you know, my mum and dad thought, my mum just thought, you know, like me. Lowell Aiken, what he lives in he lives in St Matthews. I went, yeah, I know it's weird, but he lives in St Matthews. He lives he lives literally a mile from my house and lived there for a while, and I never knew. In fact, 
there's a club around the corner where he used to play all the time. We, I just thought he was some old black guy that played in the club. But it was because he, he was under the name Lorenzo. I'd been in that club many times, but didn't realise it was the Low Lake. Oh, it's amazing, amazing. And the, the good thing about the thing that I always like about Lowell, he would try anything. You know, if, whatever the latest thing was going on, you know, the amount of times I've been to studio to do a new Jack Swing song, Lowell. Uh, acid song, a drum and bass song, um, hmm. stand by me with a soul to soul beat, but with a reggae drop back. It's just, I, I'd be like, he'd, he'd do covers of songs, and he'd, one, one song I remember him doing, and it was um, Get on the Good Foot by James Brown. And I went, Well, oh, it's Get on the Good Foot, Lowell. He said, No, it's not. It's Really G today. <laughs> and then he just, he just called his song Really G. Oh, it was amazing. It really was. I mean, I played bass for him in the studio, guitar for him in the studio. Keyboards for him in the studio, done backing vocals, percussion. You know, it's all just, just, it was just, you never knew what was going to happen. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, one, one quick question. Did you play on Sally Brown? Uh, which version? Um, because know. there's a potato, potato, we did a version and Potato 5 did a version. Um, but the Potato 5 version was done first. Um, okay. Well, let, let me play this and you tell me yeah. which version yeah. is. Uh, so I did the go. Um, ignore that. All right. Well, we'll do that. But, uh, but what I did do is, um, strangely enough, um, the iconic recording of Skinhead, I played bass on. Ah. Strangely enough, don't ask me why. I think I was there in the yeah. bass guitar in the corner, and I said we're doing Skinhead. I haven't got that one teed up, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure where the sound's gone, but never mind. OK, well, th thank you for that, Stan. So we're, we're in a bit of a tag team. So we've got Roy that was backing um, Laurel in the 60s. We've got you that was backing in the 80s. Yeah. Um, when I talk about my bit, I'm going to talk about, in fact, I played bass with, uh, with Paul Fox. And, of course, Rutz DC yeah. backed Laurel in the very late 70s. Just in the Today, yeah. So... There's the connection. Done the 60s, we've got a bit of the 70s. You're in the 80s. And Steve, I'm going to throw this over to you now because I think uh, you can genuinely say that you were backing him in the 90s. Is that right? Yeah, I met Laurel in about 19, uh, 1994. And I think it was in 1995. He on an album that he made for Grover Records called um, The Story So Far. I played rhythm guitar on that. And after that, he called me up to join the Pressure Tenants for some gigs in Ireland and Wales. Um, and then later in the 90s, my band Freetown um, with uh, Drew uh, on on and um, I think it was Steve Cracklin or something on the trumpet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we we backed Laurel on some tours of Germany and Scandinavia, which were very very good fun. My, my um, one one of the important things I I think about Laurel was he was a polyglot. He had many tongues. Uh, Spanish being his mother tongue, but he also spoke German, Italian, French, uh, and he never stopped learning. He, on tour in Germany, he'd, he'd have an hour's German lesson from the tour manager um, every day. And uh, in addition to all these languages, he, he had lots of voices in English. He had his Leicester accent. He had a sort of uh, London. Brixton Jamaican accent. He had the yard style Jamaican accent. And, and whenever we were checking into hotels or if we were asking directions, he had this upper class English voice. <laughs> He'd say, I say, um, could you tell us to find the, uh, the boogie shack or whatever the venue was called? And uh, it was just remarkable. So many voices, you know. And 
although he was deadly serious when it came to his music, um, Stan's talked about the phone conversations. Well, back in those days, people used to answer phone messages and Laurel's answer phone was always the same message. He would say, Steve, call me as soon as you get this message. <laughs> and uh, yeah. But yeah. as well as being really serious, he was often very comical. He, mm. he would take a collection of hats on, on tour. He wouldn't trust anyone else to look after his hats and he wouldn't leave them in the room. So when he came out of the hotel, sometimes he'd be wearing three hats. <laughs> he'd have a baseball cap, a pork pie hat, and straw boater on top, and he'd come out of the hotel wearing all three. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I, I... And I think um, one of my biggest impressions from him was that he always, always had time for his fans. After the show, however late it was, however tired he was, there would be a queue of fans outside the dressing room waiting to come in, talk to Laurel, He'd sign their posters, pose for photographs, always happy to see them. That was a real lesson for me. So how long did you play for him, Steve, over the years? Well, well the last, I think the last gig we did was live at Scott Club Scar, which you recorded. Right, so that would take it to 2000 then. So that would be the guts of six, seven years that you were playing with him then. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, that, 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 that's good. Well, well, we'll come back to that that live recording. So now I'm going to uh, pass across to um, yet another uh, player who's played with, with Laurel and I think was a member of your Freetown group, and that's Mr. Yeah. Drew Stansel. So, Drew, let's hand hey. on and let's have some reminiscences. Um, well, like you guys, um, we all um, knew Laurel's music and we all loved his music. And the time I got to play with Laurel was just very lucky for me. First thing, he was from Leicester. And I was playing in a band called The Splitters with Steve Cracknell, as you uh, mentioned before, the trumpet player. Um, and Laurel had just started playing, I believe, with um, Freetown, who, um, Steve's band, yeah. who um, didn't have a brass section. So Laurel somehow knew Steve, and Steve said to me, do you want to um, go and play with Laurel? We can um, have a little audition. And I was like, wow, yeah, of course I do. So um, I turned up at this place in Leicester, a little um, studio, and Laurel turned up with just a, a ghetto blaster. And basically, he just pressed play. Didn't even say what the songs were or nothing like that. And just said, you know, just join in. So luckily, I managed to do that. I just managed to join in on the tunes and... Um, and that was kind of the audition. And Laurel, about two weeks later, uh, Laurel said, right, we've got a tour. And at the time, I was really only um, playing saxophone for about three years because I used to play guitar before that. Um, and I remember the first gig we did, um, it was at um, the Borderline in London. Um, and before that, I'd only played in, you know, pubs and rubbish kind of venues with where the, the sound system was terrible no monitors and stuff like that but that night got there lovely venue uh, great monitors i could hear myself i was playing and i was thinking wow this is amazing um and i did the gig and i always remember um going to the uh, um the the, the the dressing room afterwards and uh, i just saw laurel's big smile big 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 big, big grin on his face and he looked for me and he went true I said, Drew, um, you were great tonight. You played great tonight, he says. And I went, oh, oh, thank you. And he went, and I, I thought you was crap. And I, I said, oh. <laughs> and he said, he said, no, not crap. He says, semi-crap. He says, but tonight you played, you took solos, and you played really great. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so I was kind of in from then. Um, and then we went on and played you know, in venues all over uh, Europe, Germany, I remember especially Holland, places like that. Um, and Laurel was, you know, such a great character. He was, uh, although he was 40 years older than me, you could talk to Laurel like he was you, the same age as you, like a friend. You could talk, you know, you could talk about all kinds of things that like mates talked about and he, he, he could relate to you just as you, you would do with your best mate that you've known 
you know, all your life. Um, and that's the, that, you know, that's the kind of person he was. And, and again, I think as Stan says, I think, um, for me, um, if it wasn't for Laurel who took that chance on me and gave me that first stage, I would never have done all the things that I did, you know, after that playing with Prince Buster and then, um, you know, the reform playing with the reform specials that would never have happened if it wasn't for Laurel. And also because of Club Scar, um, I ended up being in the house band and Club Scar, which then brought Mark brought all the Jamaicans over, and I ended up playing with um, Alton Ellis and Rico and stuff like that. So it was a fantastic, fantastic learning curve. Um, and the way, you know, the way to play Jamaican music, it learned, I, I learned a lot from that. It's so, um, so laid back and so. Um, you know, anything can happen. It wasn't it wasn't like you rehearsed a tune twenty times so it, it, it stayed the same. Anything could happen on that tune. Uh, it was just feel vibes, um, and it was just great. It was great to be there. It was great to be there at that time. And the, the time I was there was from around ninety eight, ninety nine, up until um, Laurel died. I played on his um, last show with him. So beautiful times. And again, like I say, if it wasn't for Laurel. I would not have had the, the career that I've had. I can honestly say that. That's, that's a nice a nice tribute. Um, so I'm going to share a few thoughts now um, and link it all back. I think we've lost Stan, um, but uh, we've still got Roy. So um, I'm still there. <laughs> good man, Roy. Good man, Roy. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of background, but then I'm going to right, come. Right. I'm going to come. Uh, us four, because there there is a there is a, a well Stan as well as a uniting story behind us. I'm going to suggest, gentlemen, that what we've really been discussing is the Academy of Laurel Aiken. Um, we're all graduates, really, because yeah. um, yeah. always a graduate from the sixties. Um, Foxy yeah. was involved in the seventies. Uh, we've got Stan in the eighties. You two chaps in the in, in the nineties and. I'm just going to show a little bit about uh, my story. So, so for me, the Leicester connection was important. Um, I was a student in Leicester in '79, um, being a West Londoner and going to the football and listening to the reggae in in, in the mighty shed as uh, as I did. I knew Laurel's music. You know, I, I was aware of Skinhead Train and so forth because I was born in 1960. I'm a little bit older. A little bit older than Stan and a little bit younger than Steve. So, <laughs> we were <laughs> for your age. <laughs> it really comes to this. Uh, I remember as, a, as, as a, a first year student in 79, uh, going along the Narborough Road, and I went into, um, I went into a, a sort of junk type shop, and there was a copy of Scandal in a Brixton Market there, uh, which was a tune I'd heard, but I didn't own a copy of it. Uh, and I bought it. It had a wonderful overstamp on it. I've still got it and played it and loved it. And then I heard, because I joined this band called the Wendy Tunes in Leicester, and mm. um, people Gaz involved Bertles. Gaz Bertle's band. Yeah. He was a tenor sax player in the group, mm. and he was also friendly with, with Tony and some other people. And mm. um, so I played, well, I joined the Wendy Tunes. Actually, they split shortly after that. But um, the Dean Sergeant, a lot of players in Leicester, but then I came into Laurel's orbit and became aware of his, his music, although I wasn't playing with him at that time. Uh, I, you know, I, it was a childhood memory, but it was stimulated. And then suddenly the second wave was was going in 79. And when Malcolm Owen of the Ruts got sick, Ruts DC backed, um, backed. Um, oh, I got a missed call from Stan. Um, yeah, Ruts DC backed Laurel. While Malcolm had problems with his throat, and you know, I was a big Ruts fan, I was a West London fan, but I was also a Laurel Aiken fan. And then over time, um, you know, with him, I mean, Paul told me he produced uh, one of uh, one of Laurel's singles. And um, a few years later, uh, in the nineties, I was recording an album, and um, I got Laurel to come along and sing on that track. In fact. Drew, you played, you played on it as well. And this yeah. is the uh, When a cup final single was needed, um, this thing was kicking around, which I co-wrote with Laurel. And I've still got it, Mark. I've still got that. You, you play on, I play. I play bass on yeah. it. 
Um, and that's around 98, something like that. Um, and um, through my friend Arthur Lurker, because um, I was at school with the Lurkers, uh, he suggested that I approach Cherry Red with this with this single, uh, which they took up, took up, uh, and away we went. So having having had a bit of success with this, um, so really it's a repetition of Sand's story and Steve's it's the Academy at work. Um, mm. Laurel said, um, "You know what we should do? We should do a live album." And uh, I said, "Well, who are we going to get to pay for that?" Then? And he said, "You'll do it. <laughs> You'll do it together." I said, we're doing it together. I mean, I, mean, this is, <laughs> I started Club Scar with my, the late, great Dave Beale, who was a, a lovely chap. And, uh, uh, and I, the more I thought about it, um, I, it gave me the confidence. This, this um, sort of began what became this. Now, what this is, was um, this is live recording, which has got you, Steve, on it, and it's got Drew on it, and it's also got Laurel and Rico on it. Um, yeah. uh, and a few other scallywags who you can see on the back of this. <laughs> anyway, I, I recorded, um, pressed it, had a thousand copies made, and then I took it to um, what was then Sanctuary uh, and John Reed, who's now with Cherry Red. And John had a look at it and he said, Oh, I really like that. He said, We'll take a license on it. So it came out as a Trojan album. And that's the occasion when we signed the Trojan deal shortly afterwards down in Andy Richard's record shop. Anyway, um, that association continued. When Laurel got sick, we made this video, which then became licensed to Cherry, which raised some money for him because he, he wasn't in a great place and there were lots of debts. You know, his illness eventually took him in 2005. Um, but the Club Scar overlay uh, my overlay with him, all of that really, the genesis of all of that was was Laurel, you know, just like Roy was saying. And then uh, through my friendship with Laurel, I got to know Roy uh, and, and and Monty. And uh, then uh, um, people wanted to hear the music of Simmered. And so Roy put the, uh, you know, started to perform again. And then I'm happy to say that all of us that have been speaking together at the moment uh, are now constituent members of the Moon Stompers playing with Mr. Roy Ellis. So um, I think, uh, which I, can I say for me is also huge, um, and I'm sure it's true for you guys, uh, a huge personal privilege. So I feel like there's a, it's a bit like all good stories. I had a great beginning, I had a wonderful middle, and um, hopefully we're not at the end yet. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. I think we should throw it back to where we began um, with Stan and Roy, really. Um, they're the earliest contributors. Uh, and since we, we are a fairly close association these days. The last time was at the Electric Ballroom. Um, Roy, I'm going to hand back to you for some closing thoughts. Since we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And then if anyone wants to add a le little bits of extras, that's fine. But back, back to you, Roy. So what, is, there, is there an Academy of Laurel Lakin? And are you a graduate? <laughs> Say it again. Uh, is there an academy of Laurel Aiken, and do you think you're a graduate? Oh, oh, you keep cutting up. I don't understand properly. You keep cutting up. It's, 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 is there a University of Laurel? Uh, and are you a graduate? I'm a graduate from Laurel, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm think... a graduate from Laurel because I, um, I learned a lot of things from him. And we learned a lot of things from Laurel because when we, when he got us to back him in the sixties, there, I mean, we just started, you know, the bees. Those days, the band was called the Bees, and uh, we were seeing with Prince Buster and the Ethiopian and Toots and the Majors and all those other people. Laurel used to be by the rehearsal and and try to tell, well, I was just a singer anyway, but try to tell the other bands and the, the musician and what to always do and how you. You know, we convert this, you know, you do this, and you know, you do that. And so, so it's, for me, it was like a school with Laurel by watching him, listening. And when I used to sing, he said, No, man, no, 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 sing that note there. Don't sing that note. You're supposed to go there, start to blah, blah, blah. You know, he's always said to correct you in the middle of the, the recording, he correct you and so on. So, but I said before, it's like a, it's like a professor. 
not only as a professor for the, the, the ska music, but as a professor by teaching and telling the musician what to do. And, you know, so as I said, I was a graduate from Laurel. You know, the whole band, as a matter of fact, because those days we just started off, we didn't know nothing about music, especially the guys who played this. We just played, it was just playing from ear, not in the school to learn. Everybody just take up instruments, I'm going to play, I'm going to play. And Laurel got us to rehearse and got us, and when we finished, we could back him, and from there on, we backed in all the people from Jamaica, as the bees, to the made Eddie Grant, and goes on. Laurel was like our music teacher, in a way by giving us the advice and so on. So your question, Mark, I was a graduate from Laurel. <laughs> you with my singing and everything, you know. I've got to throw it to Stan. Thank you, Roy. That was, that was very clear. Thank you. For sure, for sure, there is no doubt. Um, without Laurel Aitken, I would have done 99% of the things I've done in the music industry. Um, joining Laurel, was probably my one of it wasn't my biggest break because that wouldn't be fair but it was the best break I ever had meeting him that day um and it's really funny um I always laugh because I remember I said to you earlier that um I told you that I could get a better horn section well I thought I was only young and um, and my two best mates played trumpet and sax and it's really funny when when I got my mate in the band to play sax, he was teaching someone to play sax himself because he was a kind of a, one of those, I play sax, I can teach. Um, one of his students was called Andrew Stansel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. Tony, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really funny. Um, yeah. And, the whole, and, and, and it's quite strange because it goes full circle the other way. Yeah. One of the one of the people that really encouraged me as a ten year old to play music was Drew's dad. Wow. Really, yeah. um, he used to work in a music shop that we used to hang around, and he wasn't one of those ones that kicked you out. He was one of the nice ones that would say, "Oh, come in, keep playing. Do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do that?" Always gave you confidence to, you know, you'd go in there. Um, he was always a great guy, and it's so it feels to me like the whole everything's all interconnected. We're all yeah, part of amazing. the same musical journey. Uh, but I always say this about the Leicester scar scene. It all started with Lower Lakin. Mm. Every every single person that plays scar, and there's a few Leicester bands, they all go, yeah, I play for Lowell. Yeah, mm. I play for Lowell. Even people that were not even to reggae and scar, you know. Um, I've been on a stage, I'll tell you this, Drew, I've been on a gig with Lowell, Drew, with... Gaz Rackham on bass. Right. <laughs> Gaz, Rackham, Gaz Rackham is one of the funkiest slap bass players in the world, but yeah. somehow he did a lot of aching gig. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. He was absolutely great. Uh, we always say that if you never played for Lowell, Lowell would come and find you. That's, that's the other thing I would. If Lowell heard that anybody was any good, he'd go and check them out mm. and find mm. a way to get them into his band. It was really great mm. like that. Or oh, get to the studio with them. It was great. Uh, that's it was, yeah. And the whole Leicester scene at one time was fantastic for um, for score and reggae, like you say. Yeah. And, and there was a whole host of brass players, and and still is. Um, but it's, like you say, it's all due to Laurel. Yeah, all we, we had a fantastic Laurel. scene there. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was, um, and we, which, in a strange way, I find it sad as well, because. I don't know how, because remember, I'm guilty of it. I know Lowell Aitken's music since I've been born. It's been in my household. It's like, but to know that that absolute legend was living an hour, well, not hour, a minute down the road by car and would, and would perform every night at the mm -hmm. uh, Costa Brava. He'd perform there and that anyone could go and see him and sit down and have a, you didn't even have to have a meal. You could just go in and there was that legend. I used to always think, how is this happening? How is how does the music mm -hmm. industry have an icon like that? Um, but I've grown up a bit and understand that the music business is not very nice. So, um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot that, um, you know, there'll be a hundred reasons why Lowell was doing that gig. Yeah, you're right there. No, we was very, we was blessed to have him in yeah. our city. Yeah. Um, just, just lucky, lucky for us. 
I can say that for me. Very lucky to um, be around just because Laura was in, in Leicester. Yeah. My, it was my lucky break. And like, like you say, I think um, for all the things I've done af after that, um, Laurel was the one that gave me that stage to, to, to begin with, and that was my luckiest break of all. That's that's me calling you because my laptop's about to die. Oh, as I said before, without Laurel, as I said before, we were, without Laurel, I would be sitting down here right now. Yeah, from the days of the bees right up to Mr. Simrip, it's all Laurel. Yeah, I met him over here and said, Where the rascal? You look, man. Fuck them guys there. <laughs> yeah. He said to me, he said, go out as Roy Ellis, a.k.a. Mr. Simmer. That's what you should do because people want to see you. You guys never tour with such a brilliant record but sell millions of copies. Oh, you, oh, you come in never tour. You're, you're singing gospel music. You're singing soul music. You're singing, but your record said, I'm the boss. You're the boss, man. For that thing. You tell the camera people let me play. Don't put the camera up on me. Put the camera up <laughs> on that man there. He is a basking head. <laughs> Larell, that was Larell. Yeah. The one who credit. You know, he just he, he, he's not the sort of guy who wants to take over. I said he's not a jealous sort of person. Put the camera up on that man there. And him yeah. that me him singing some of them songs. Them when I'm did the the first Simmers concert, uh, concert with Monty in club's car, Laurel was supposed to come down to the concert to join us, like a jubilee, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, okay. a, day before, a day before the concert, he, he passed away. Ah, oh, I see. You know, mm. the day before the concert in club's car, that was the first, the first ever concert under the name of Simmerick. And Mark Wyatt put that on. Nobody did. Because before it used to be the, the pyramids, and, yeah. and, and, and Monty and I was uh, performing at Simmer. And now I was supposed to come down to meet Monty because we met already in Switzerland, and uh, you know, and Mark went up to see him and he was ready to come, and the next day he died. Yeah. That was uh, 2005, that was. Yeah. 2005. Yeah. 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 Do you remember Mark, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because it was the first time Simmer had. Been yeah, exactly. Yeah. Made for since 69 or 70 or something crazy. Wow. I mean, in, yeah, because we, were, we were playing, but we're not under that name. Not under that name, exactly. So, we were touring and pioneering the reggae music in 1970 in Finland, Sweden, France, all over Middle Europe. And you, nobody knew what reggae music was those days when, when we were touring. You know, nobody knew what reggae music was. The only reggae music what they knew was Desmond Decker, my Israelite, and Jimmy Cliff. Vietnam and the hard and the uh, uh, Vietnam and a uh, wonderful world and and Jim and Johnny Nash and um, hold me tight. But those people didn't know that was reggae. The rhythm they thought it was just a normal pop song. Yeah. Every concert we did, people walked out. <laughs> Some mm -hmm. people say we were playing jungle music and all the stuff. Talk. <laughs> yeah, that's what. And look, ten years later, <laughs> and you know, I went to Spain. Nobody wanted to introduce, you know, so it just disappeared and so on. And 12 years later, Reggae was big. But Marley, these, particular, but Jimmy Cliff was always there from Anjali Nash and Desmond, you know. Yeah, so, um, back to Laurel, he's a man who uh, keep, thing, keep the music going and keep, and it's still going on because I, I see those little local radio stations, they keep playing a lot of, uh, even some, the young bands them you know playing a lot of um laurel songs them you know it's true it's they, true they, they yeah. playing a lot of laurel songs you know and that's always good for the artist even if it's, you passed away and people keep singing the songs them and so on that keeping you alive yeah, yeah. Well, since, i'm so sorry I, I think we should have a go at this now i happen to know i happen to know that drew has got his saxophone there Oh, yeah, I have, yeah. Give, give us a quick first on the saxophone. Um, okay, it might be quite loud. Um, That's okay. A quick, quick low tune. A quick, a quick burr. Two bars. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
it's funny, but I'm going to tell you this little story. It's really when I when I joined Lowell, he was playing the odd black venue, but ninety percent of the venues were white, and we we were playing. Um, everyone called it Scar at the time, and I didn't understand what they were talking about because to me it wasn't Scar. I kept thinking um, I never thought that two tone was Scar. I thought that two tone was two tone. So. When they were saying it's Scott, I was kind of I was kind of confused because I'd grown up with Zion City, going back to New Orleans, Sweet Jamaica, um, bartender. I, yeah, I kept thinking, oh well, why don't he play them songs? So I used to always say to him, like, oh, why don't you do, you know, your blue beat stuff? The people don't want to hear it. I said, you joke, and I remember saying to him, yeah, just play it, Lowell, because you can't get more authentic than you doing that stuff. Um, so we, 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 I think the first track we did was Bad Minded Woman and it went down a storm and the band just took to it like, you know, it was like, they said, yeah, this is what we should be doing. Instead of doing a, a, a no disrespect to um, Sally Brown, Skinhead and uh, what's the other one I love? Um, forgot the name of it at the moment. But then we kept thinking, well, well, why can't we do them all? Why can't we do your whole story from when you began to where you are now and it was great for me because what you've done you played freedom Ta freedom which is one of my favorite ones and you just played zion city which is one and to me that's my that's how i heard lowell aitkin they were the first songs i heard of lowell aitkin i knew i knew lowell aitkin as a guy that if his records were blue or his records were yellow i didn't know what they meant at the time but i know now it's blue beat or rio or Palmer, and but I know if I put them on, the the rhythm would go, and uh, to me he was the perfect man, perfect man doing just great. I loved him, I loved him, I loved him. It was like it was, it it was like someone had asked me to drink a cup of tea playing for all. It was just so perfect. That's, that, they're the songs that I used to love, like the, the songs that you just said, yeah. the, the, the old stuff, the gospel stuff, the yeah. score with Laurel stuff. Yes. Um, they were the songs, but you're right, he never played them when I was when I was with him. He put them in a medley, wouldn't he? Yeah, at yes, times. Yes. But um, he'd play all the the, 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 the the Sally Browns and stuff like that because he knew that the crowd wanted to hear that. Exactly. But, but one thing I'd say about the crowds as well with Laurel is that it's, one thing I, I saw straight away was that how, how much love there was in the crowd for Laurel. You could feel it straight yeah. away. And same, and same with Roy, same with Roy as well. Yeah. You could feel that you could feel the crowd's love. Uh, they knew the words, they knew the songs, they, they, knew, they knew them better than I did. Yeah. I think it's the authenticity, you know, yeah. you know, you know, it's not, it's not someone trying to be that, it's someone who is that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, man. You have, you only can say about learn. The only or the thing you can say about Laurel, you just have to learn. When, you know, when he was when, when you're with the guy, all you can do, you just have to learn. You, you keep learning. He's funny. He gives jokes that you can tell it further on. And oh, make people yeah. laugh. He, he's just a sad person. You can oh, you can. You know, he's and also he's a good nurse because I had an accident one time on the M1. And um, uh, the band, the, the bees couldn't play that night, so he took me to his home. And he's got a girlfriend called Joyce, and she take care of me with my head bandaged up and everything and whatever. And all. and Laura said, "You stay with me, woman. Me go make the band. Me go sing some song with them, some of them old time songs and what the band used to back me with, with, with um, over the years back, a few years back." We, we cover up the whole thing because we tell the people, we will tell the people and say this thing is sick and so on. And he did that for me, you know, and, and sing some songs in the band in this big civil hall in, in, uh, in uh, Answorth, it was, uh, some big hall there. And Larry take over and, and do, the, do the show with some of the songs that we used to back him with and so on. He's that sort of person. But yeah, I don't know what happened after the con <laughs> after we went back to London. This woman follow me. This <laughs> 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 woman follow me all the way to London and up to this day. Till that dad come to Switzerland, I was nine in 2005. Lord, I said, boy, 
Boy, you take with my woman for a minute. <laughs> and this was 1965, you know. 1965, yes. then you're talking about 55 years. Then it's about 55 years ago. And it was that, that, you know, now it's like 55 years ago. Well, uh, Lauren said, Boy, I think we can talk about the old days or whatever. So, boy. We look up to you in my house and we pick up my woman and we go to London back with the band and you take away my woman. You <laughs> meet up those guys and make up Mick, the bass player in Finland. And if we ride there. I say, Ra, I live in Switzerland. That rascal taking my woman. <laughs> and never, I never take her away. She yeah. followed me to London. Yeah. You know, these things happen in hospital every day, you know, Mark. There are some people look up to patient nurses and they end up married to the, the, the patient. Yeah, yeah. That happens. It does that and stuff, you know. So, but we, we have a good laugh about it in Switzerland, you know, and we make some pictures and so on. Larry, love that man to death. As I said before, they keep repeating it. Without Larry, I would be sitting here today because he discovered the bees. Yeah. yeah. And uh, producers. Then blah, 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 blah. And everything. Meet you guys. Meet Mark again. It's, 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 it's the same Laurel line, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 The family. Yeah. The Laurel family. Yeah, it's the same that because without Laurel, I would know know you guys. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you guys come to the same channel, you know, like a like a virus. It's like a virus. <laughs> <laughs> Laurel virus is this. <laughs> it's really true because a lot of people didn't see the funny side of Laurel when he was travelling with the bands because he could be a joker. He was he was one of the lads, but. What I liked about him, he could be one of the lads and he'll laugh with you. And then the next minute, he'd just switch on you and go, time to work. Yeah. And, and like, yeah. You had to be. Yeah. But, but when he used to, because uh, we used to call him the stirrer, because if you told Lowell something, if Lowell found out a little bit of your weakness, he'd use it against you. He'd go, <laughs> he'd, go he'd, he'd go to, I think I said, um, I think he said to Flymo one day, he said to Flymo, um, I think I was messing around at the sound check and he said, um, oh, that stands all right. You know, he's playing drums. Now he's going on bass. He's going to blah, blah, blah. And uh, Flamo said, yeah, he's playing them all the instruments, but he's crap at it. <laughs> right, so that's, what, that's what Flamo said. Anyway, when I walked in, I walked back into the dressing room and Flamo left. Low, low went, uh, Bertie said, you're crap. <laughs> he says, he says, you think you can play all the mischief, but you're crap. And I went, what? And I flew out the room to find Bertie, right? And I'm going, what is it? And uh, Bertie's looking past me, looking at Lowell, going like this. Sniggering, <laughs> 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 man. I thought, oh, he set us up brilliantly. He's so funny. Yeah. You can't say positive thing about that guy. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing negative. Yeah, nothing. He doesn't make trouble. He just tell you what's not right, tell you straight. You know, but as I said, the, as I said, Stan, the music, you know, the music scene is very wicked to everybody, you know. You know, yeah. you, uh, that man should be a, like a, that man should be have millions in, in his pocket. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. millions and millions, you know. Yeah, but I see Larry like a Columbus, you know, Larry is like a Columbus in my eyes, you know, it's like Columbus, well, he didn't discover the world, but we say, the Western people say Columbus covered the world, and in the end, in the end, what happened to Columbus? He died in prison. Yeah. Poor. Yeah. 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 yeah, he died in prison, yeah. poor Columbus. And Larry put a lot, look all, look all the... The, 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 you know, all this stuff that's happening in England, look at all those specials and all those guys, yes, yes, yes. they got bad manners, all of it. We don't uh, record Laurel songs, they might make millions from it and thousands, and Laurel died with almost nothing, you know? It, it, um, when when I joined Lowell, he was he was in litigation with the beat over ranking full stop. Yeah. Um, and Lowell won his case, but his legal fees, were more than he got awarded. Mm. And he said, I'm never going to, he said, what was the point? Um, yeah. The beat, that song now has gone on, I mean, I love the beat. Who would have thought that the beat would be iconic 30, 40 years later? Mm, that's, that's what I'm trying to say, you know. And that, and that money that's generated, I don't know what, I don't know what Lowell signed away or gave away, but he doesn't get any money from Ranking Full Stop anymore. No, no, no. So, Shame. You know, 
Yeah. And I used to go to me, it's my tune, it's Pussy Bryce. I always go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of them, all of them. But um, they all screwed, you know, Larry left a big legacy behind him here. And he kind of goes on because the new generation come and taking over, taking over. You can't go any further. You only have to go back. Two generations of people have yet to go go back. This Laurel and Simmerim. Laurel and Simmerim. But all the way till you just, you know, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to be like that. Right. The new generation, because I'm on a few Scar forums, and they all they all know who Laurel is. You know, they they know all of his songs. They know who he is. Yeah. If, if Laurel was to gig tomorrow, it'd be sold out. Yeah, of course. 100%. Yeah. Chaps, can I just throw this in? I think if he did gig tomorrow, this is the one I'd want. Uh, uh, pretty much top of the dial. Let's give this a go. <laughs> Good morning, woman. My band El Pussycat, we always play this tune. Yeah, Boogie My Bones is the first tune we play at the start of the set. Yeah. My Mind and Woman's in the set as well, still yeah. today. Yeah. yeah, just classic. The words yeah. are classic as well. Yeah. In fact, yeah. the strangest Absolutely. thing, the first gig I ever did outside of church, I used to be, I, I used to think I was going to be the new Michael Jackson. I was a singer in a band, never forget it, 1975. It was the first gig I ever done outside of the church, and I sang three songs. I sang John Holt's Help Me Make It Through the Night, Johnny Clark's Move Out of Babylon, and Lowell Aitken's Bugaboo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it, Bugaboo. Yeah, Bugaboo. Bugaboo. Yeah, Bugaboo. My, and Bugaboo, at that time, my brother would have been six, and Bugaboo was his favourite record. Yeah. And, do you know what I mean? You do, do, do you know what that means, Bagaboo? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's Jamaican. That means, your, that means you're holding the blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, somebody said to you, what? you like Bagaboo, that means you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why, and, and that's why I love the lyrics for Bad Minded Woman and the lyrics for Bagaboo because, because yeah. that's just low. Telling his story. Yeah. But I, I, I just slip this in quick. Don't forget, you don't, but you, you might not know this, but all of those artists who came after in Jamaica when Larry left the country, a lot of them old songs and those, those old traditional stuff, well, a lot of them make money with. But Larry was singing them songs. All this stuff, for example, One Love, One Heart, Let Get Together and Feel the Right. Bob Marley didn't write that song. I know, it's That's true. Those, those old Jamaican. Yeah. traditional songs them you know yeah. Lara used to sing those songs too yes exactly you're right it was yeah, sing all those old Jamaican songs with those guys you would need to run up them in hip hop uh, dance hall and uh, all of them kind of, you know, Larry used to sing all of those songs maybe didn't record them but he used to sing them exactly yeah. the old gospel songs and so on in his own style yes so a lot of Jamaican artists have, uh, there's a, a matter of fact there's a cemetery in Jamaica I don't know if you know about this with all the Jamaican icon yeah, there is, is, you yeah. know this, right? But they wanted to bring Laurel there, but it's, you know what they did? You know what happened? They said uh, they're disappointed from Laurel because after he left, he didn't go back to Jamaica. Did you That's know that? He'd never been back. Um, did he not do? Oh, yeah. Did he not do Sunsplash? I know. I never hear about that. Done, I think Shay took him once. I think. Yeah, um, but it, but he didn't. He didn't like it. Didn't like it. I don't know what I'm, I don't, but I, uh, I read that they said it, it, it was supposed to be uh, buried in Jamaica in this big cemetery for Jamaican artists and so on. It, it, it is not there. The name is there, but they didn't yeah, bury it there, so whatever, you know. So it, it, pe people, that, for me, that, it's hard. To, I think it's hard to comprehend for my generation or your generation after me how massive Lowell Lake Kim was. Yeah, there, was yeah. there wasn't a black household. That had a record, a, a Scar Rock Steady or Reggae record in the house that didn't have one by Lowell Aitken. No, of course. Impossible. impossible. Yeah. Um, it, it, it always, always 
Um, uh, it's not a bane of contention. I always think Lowell taught me so much being on stage because Lowell was would make some irrational decisions. You think I'd be going, where's he gone now? Um, but what Lowell taught me was always be ready. Always be ready. It's like it's like James Bond. It's, it, something would come in his head, and he would just go there, and you just have to follow. Yeah. yeah. Keep on your toes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you tell, you become follow, you look at you and go, uh, it was disgusted. It, it was, you had to learn really quick. Yeah. yeah but not really, uh, uh, it's not a routine man, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. not a routine man. You just, uh, you follow him. Yeah. Same thing we used to back him too. Yeah. We yeah. made a yeah. mistake, and the mistake what we made is there with us. Eh? Yeah, after, yeah. after the gig, he said, me never learn, you know, that, you know, and that, you know, supposed to play. <laughs> The that is what we learn, and that we learn, you know. But because we make the mistake, the band make the mistake, not me. Yeah. Just follow the band, you know. Yeah. So you know how to, you know. It's very flexible. It's good. I, yeah. He taught me. He taught me, he taught me how to uh, watch the singer as well. Yeah. Right? yeah. Watch role to see where we're going. Yeah. And now, and I do that with you always. Now. Yeah, exactly. I'm, that's I'm I learned very much watching you. That's what I learned from Lauren. And every yeah. You know, I, I've been, Backed by hundreds of bands since I came back yeah. as Rob Ellis. You know? And uh, this is my first impression to the band. I always tell them, listen, doesn't matter what happens on the stage, just watch me. Yeah. Yeah. Just watch me because I mean, sometimes I get black out, you never can tell what but just watch me. Follow me everywhere I go, follow me. Just yeah. keep. You know, so I always work with the drummer. Not yet the musician. Them yeah. the, 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 always say, the drummer is the man you're supposed to follow, and him keep the beat. <laughs> and him start the band, and then him stop the band. So him is supposed to follow. So make him follow. Go on, Frank. Just watch me. Anything you do, you follow me. Yeah. Because you know what I mean. So yeah. That's yeah. Parallel. So you not, not all the artists are, are, are good at that. Yeah. Um, some of them just leave you to it and yeah. expect you to read their minds. But you're you're really good at that, Roy. Um, yeah. Leading just like Laura was. Yeah, that's how I learned. That's from my experience with the music as singer. I learned it for Laurel. I learned a lot from uh, another great guy as well, should be, should, should be really on top, because I will forget about him by the interview just now. Don't fool around with this guy called um, Owen Gray. That was a, that's a great artist, Jamaican artist. I, I played with him as well, Owen. Owen Gray. Owen Gray. Owen Gray. Yeah. We used to back him in the 60s, yeah. so I did. I learn a lot from him as well because you know the guy can play. He's very talented, and it's always said, always oh, listen to the drummer, the Jamaican thing. How oh, we make the drummer, how oh, we make the drummer. The drummer is the man, is the backbone in the band because a drummer. This is what Owen used to say, and Larry said the same thing too. A good drummer can make a, a stupid band sound great. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You see, and a bad and a bad drummer can make a great band sound. From so, yeah. So that's why we have Dave Anderson. That's why we have to play drums anymore. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. the <a> philosophy. <laughs> great drummer can make a stupid band sound great. Yeah. And a great yeah. drummer, a great band, you know, if I got a drummer who can play good, fantastic. I have a stupid band, you can make it good, and vice versa. Yeah. And the other thing I learned from Laurel, and it's yeah. the same thing that Jamaican. It's a Jamaican philosophy. Um, the same thing uh, from Owen Gray. Yeah. I learned a lot of things from Owen Gray because we used to back him to being back in the sixties after Laurel. We used to back him up, you know, and then everything just disappears. The bees. Laurel, uh, Owen Gray is a great artist. Yeah. And he's yeah. a he's a one of Jamaican. Laurel, I forget about it. Laurel, Owen Gray, and Alton Ellis. These are the three Jamaican icons. Yeah. He's a great entertainer, isn't he? Yeah. Owen Gray. And he's got some great tunes. Yeah, great tunes. Yeah, yeah I always great. love his tunes because they've got the the, the the very um saxophone in it. Yeah. It's got a lot of saxophone in it. So for me, I love I love playing with him. It's really funny because I always say, you know, sometimes I think my sometimes I'm, I'm really I don't understand how lucky I am, and then I get hit in the head and I think I've played for Owen, Alton, Lowell, Desmond, Prince Buster, Derek. Mm -hmm. Roy, amazing, isn't it? amazing. It's amazing. If you'd have told yeah. me that as an eight-year-old in 1970, yeah. never believed it. Would you? Never believed it. I never believed it. And 
the saddest thing about every single one of the people I've named is they should be millionaires. Not just because they're millionaires in their soul and their music is, but million the 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 prop the the reaps and the rewards that are around in the industry that they don't get access to is oh. absolutely shocking. Absolutely shocking. Well, that's how the music game is, my friend. Yeah. I'm a very rich guy, which, but I'm rich in what I learned in the music. <laughs> exactly. <That's, laughs> but, but the trouble is, what it is, it's because of our desire to play. Yeah, yeah. I will play till I drop. Yeah. And it's it's the love, and it? The love of music. The love of it's music. music. It makes you, you rich. You know? For sure, for sure, you knew that with Lowell. You knew that Lowell loved being on stage or Me being too. in the studio. Right. He loved it. Because people dancing, man, and you people listening to your record and singing yeah. songs with you, yeah. uh, 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 little kids, and they look. That makes you feel inside rich. The other, yeah. The other, yeah. The, other, the other money, okay, need money, but the rest is just vanity. Yes. It's just vanity. Yeah. But yeah. on stage, when you're on the stage, you're a rich person because you don't have to sing. Yeah. Come to see you, uh, and you just close your eyes, and from the moment you start the song, people sing the song from the beginning to the end. What 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 more you want? You know. Yeah. You know, that's that's great feeling, man. That's what. Yeah. Saying. I I mean, when I, when I first started playing with Lowell, I think we used to get forty pound. He used to go to Germany for forty pound, yeah. but it was it was the um the, the you know like you say the gigs and the 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 entertainment and the, the crack oh, that yeah. I had yeah. that was yeah. worth worth yeah. more than any any yeah. any yeah. 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 Can, the can adventure of it all. This story, guys. So um, this is Laurel's first ever album, Scar with Laurel. And mm. he, he told me the story of this, um, but I'd like your input. So he'd come to England and he'd had some success and he made some money because he was putting on dances and, and he used to get his old friend Duke Vin to come along and, and, and help him with that, who had been a DJ on Tom the Great Sebastian sound system. Uh, and he told me, he said, I saved up for a couple of years and then I, I went back to Jamaica with my savings and he was friendly with Lloyd Brevitt, the bass player. Yeah. Oh, yeah, from Scatterland. I contacted Brevitt and Brevitt said, I can get you into Federal Studio, which was like like the studio, really, in, in, in Jamaica in those days. Uh, and he says, um, well, what am I going to do for a backing band? And Brevitt said, well, don't worry, I'll, 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 I'll organise something. And he, in these three days, he got his mate Lloyd, um, Lloyd Nibs, you know, the, the, the yeah. drummer. So we got the bass player and the drummer from the Scatolites. And um, uh, there he was, Laurel was laying out his, his songs that he wanted to record through the course of the three days. And Lloyd, the two Lloyds loved it so much that before the afternoon was out, <laughs> he got the whole of the Scatterlights yeah. down there playing with on these sessions. So when, when we played Bad Minded Woman and you were saying, Stan, just, you know, that's it, that's, that's foundation scar right there. Um, that's, he's got the Scatterlights behind him. But yeah. it's that same thing, you know, when you when you play with somebody who you respect, who you learn from, who you enjoy being in their company and, and they've got good tunes, um, that's, you know, he, he swept them along. And, and, and <laughs> that's how he got back from his butt. It's, it, that 63 session with the Scatterlights is iconic. It's, because it was like... Um, I just thought, for some reason, I thought he did that before he left um, Jamaica. I didn't realise that he went back and did it. He came over in around 60, um, uh, and he was doing the Blue Beat stuff 60, 61. Yeah. Um, and, and Rico, he got Rico to come out, in, in, come to the UK in around 61. They did Judgment Day together in 60. Yeah. And, and all that money off all those dances, you know, that's what it was going towards. He had this master plan, which is why... You know, in 63, somebody who looked so far as the UK market, you know, the average pop market was concerned, uh, and maybe a lot about, he's got not just a compilation album, he's got this whole thing. He took the master tapes to Graham Goodall, and um, and Goody loved it so much that um, he put it out, and it became Rio, the first LP on Rio. But, but, but Laura owned the tapes, and... Uh, but of course, talking of the late great Goodall, 
and um, Dr. Bird label and yeah. all the rest of it. Of yeah, course, Graham Goodall. Uh, Graham Goodall is, uh, is, you know, that's another connection. You, Roy, with Simmer yeah. and yeah, Graham. Yeah. He was the man. He was the man behind the Simmer there. Yeah. 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 Graham Goodall. He produces Skinny Boonstam, the whole album with, yes. with, with Philip Chung. You know, these are great musicians. They, yes. These are great guys to to have in your remembrance because um, they bring the Jamaican music quite away. You yes. know, the the great people. But when he's saying like, you know, the heart of a band is is its drummer. You know, well, what you've got on your first LP, Lloyd Nibs playing drums. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right, good. Just, uh, if I like it, yeah. a, a bass player of the caliber of. Uh, just, <laughs> so, what about me with my first recording? My first recording before I met uh, Laurel. Shot that with a minute. My first recording with a guy, you must heard about him, Mark, a guy called Sonny Burke. Oh, yes, yes. Sonny Burke, saxophone player. And when my first recording, and my first thing that I ever written, where I've ever written, uh, the guy in the studio, I couldn't believe it. George the Fame was an organ. That, 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 the, George yeah. the Fame wasn't big then. He was uh, working in Flamingo those days as, as the with the Blue Flame, you know. And he was a good friend from a guy called Mike Reed on saxophone, Ernest Wrangling on guitar, Eddie hey. Tantan on trumpet. Tantan, yeah. Yeah. Tony Washington and piano. Uh, mm. But I can't remember the bass guy name or whatever. But these are the main, these are, these are, these are famous guys. These are the guys um, who was, in, uh, you know, who was um, really supporting the Jamaican music. George, because those days, George, the famous playing so music, but he was a great, he was a great friend from uh, Prince Boston. You know that, yeah. George, the famous. Yeah. 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 And then that was my first record. How oh, proud could I be? You know what I mean? And then. Shortly after that, I met Laurel. And all of these guys mm. used to work with Laurel as well. Because, mm. as I said, Laurel was the producer for the Melodist Blue Beat uh, record. Mm. With Ziggy Jackson. You, you know, oh, yeah, 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 Ziggy. Ziggy Jackson and Charlotte. He, he, Ziggy Jackson from Poland. Yeah. And Charlotte is from Austria. You know? And, and the, all of these guys was working together. Everybody know each other, you know? So, um... And I was lucky to be a, I was lucky to, to be among these people, you know, and get a little experience. I was, I, I call myself, as I said, I'm lucky. Is that the way? Not lucky. I'm a little bit lucky in love and lucky with my music, but I'm not lucky to have the money. I didn't get that I'm bad lucky that way. <laughs> Making money, same thing with Ariel. Lucky, maybe lucky in love. And lucky in the music because the music took me a lot of places where I never think in my life I would ever reach. But only thing didn't get the money from it. But it doesn't matter. The most important thing is life, my friend. Life, life. Yeah. And that's a pity Laura didn't live a little bit longer because I could have still living. There's a lot of people yeah. who's older than Laura and still living, you know? Yeah. yeah. No one would be like you, he would still be gigging if he was here. He yeah. was gigging. Uh, with Derek Morgan still gigging? Yeah, there you go, still gigging. Uh, 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 and a lot of other, other, other old artists are still gigging, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's it would. The, it's not the age, age, the more, the more old it is when the music scene, the old is, is the more, is the more you accept from the, from the public or because the young generation wants to see you, you know? Because it's, that's, he's the one who's caused us to be here because the music started from these people, you know? The, um, it's very important if you can be healthy and live a certain age in the entertainment business. You know, there's a lot of Larry Robbins still filling up places. You know, yes. he didn't have to do nothing on the stage because when he came over in Switzerland in 2005, when he sees concert, I mean, he just stand there and uh, uh, um, people just just amaze. Yeah. You know, just looking at him like that. You know, yeah. Yeah. and he was singing. You know, a little bit, you know, I don't know, put on weight and he was singing some songs with a key, but the people didn't care about that. Yeah. And it was one song, I think everybody experienced this. One song was supposed to play the harmonica. Oh, that. And it, it couldn't find, um, because the, the stage is full with harmonica. Oh, what a key. <laughs> what key? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I forgot what song was supposed to play it in. And it put a cool wrong key. Grab another one. Yeah, wrong yeah, that's key. Exactly. That was, 
that was an iconic Lowell. He'd, he'd grab it, he'd play a bit. No, not that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. doing that to everybody, isn't he? Everybody. <laughs> Even though he's yeah, a, for the people, you know, and didn't I realize Laurel didn't have to do much. Yeah. He didn't do much singing because you know he's singing and uh, and he walk and then they the stamp the, talking about Moonstone be the stamp the stage out yeah. till he came back on the stage. Yeah. I remember I remember exactly what he said. Exactly what he said. You know why I come back? Because I love you. Because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and we are mad about you. Yeah. We are mad about we you. We are mad right. about you. Yeah. yeah. Because, well, and in Basel said, because I love you. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. and come back and repeat, and repeat, and cover the songs of what, you know? And it's, 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 gone, it's, not forget, it's gone, but not forget, my friend. Yeah. Um, no, never. 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 It's, it's Is Steve a, Harris still here? Yeah. Yeah. I can see him. Steve, yeah, I'm still here, Drew. I, I, I just wanted, I wanted if you wanted to tell him about when the race is caught in the door. Steve. He's <laughs> frozen again. Oh, he's back. He's back. It was um, at the beginning of the set. He always played. Yeah, at the beginning of the set. Bartender. It was. Um, uh, and there was an intro, ding, ding, yeah, ding, 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 and left it half a minute or to build up the suspense. But one night we'd been playing it for about two minutes, and he still was he still, still hadn't come out. from his curtain, he said, Steve, Steve, backstage put my guitar down, went backstage, and there he was all tangled up in his braces. He said, oh, you've got to help me. <laughs> he had to help him get untangled from his braces so he could come on stage. Yeah. Well, yeah. other bands play the intro, and we're, like you say, we're about two minutes into it. Everyone's looking at each other. Where is, going, yeah. Where is he? Where is he? And then you, you got the shout, yeah. I remember that night. <laughs> I'm going to cut in at this point and, and I think we should listen to this because we get to hear Laurel's voice uh, and uh, this is all tied up with braces so let's have a bit of this Vince is your boss King has speaking on the city plane for Rainbow City get back relax have a quick crack a check a joke Listen on your dancing shoe and listen while your boss can it suck it to you. Suck it to me, suck it to me, suck it to me. Skin it to him down. Skin it to him classic yeah yeah, yeah. I, 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 but it's funny because when when you look were massive roy yeah that skinhead sound that 69 sound yeah. it's like it's it's such an iconic sound you know that yeah, and then what it, the production everything about it it's it's like for me it was like detroit had its motown london london that time had that that sound. That, 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 you know, you know, we, you know, gave us the sound. When Prince Buster came over, we got this guy, the he, he, uh, uh, coordinator, yeah. was Lin Tate. Oh, Lin was it? What a guitarist. Yeah, you know, and he taught our guitar player the rock steady movement and this back flip and all them tinic and all them sort of yeah. stuff there. And he taught him. The, it was very easy for a guitar player in Simmer because many, many years ago in Jamaica, when he was in the church, he used to play banjo. Oh, okay. So moving from banjo to guitar is got this is very familiar with the picking. Mm -hmm. yes. It's a was the man. So we learned a lot of stuff from you know. So um, uh, that was a very great influence, uh, Lintay. Um, I wanted to say something, but it missed me. Go on, Stan, till he comes back. I, I wanted to say. I was going to say, Drew, um, the best Lintay impersonator I know is Kerry. You know, Kerry. Kerry. Yeah. Kerry. Kerry. Yeah. Kerry. Kerry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
when I when I joined Lowell's band, because I've known Kay for years, I, we used to live on the same street. When I joined the band, he was one of the guitarists. I couldn't believe the way he could go. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. How are you? How are you, how are you doing it? He said, I don't know. I'm just doing that. But he could just do that triplet, <laughs> that triplet pig into. Yeah, but I'm sure you still listen to Linted. He must have. He must have. You don't listen to Linted because Linted is original with that sort of now, when he was he from Jamaica, you know, he was from uh, Trinidad. Oh, was he? I didn't know that. No, he was not Jamaican. He's, oh. a Trinidad. He's from Trinidad. I about Trinidad or Barbados, but I know he was from Jamaica. I've oh, probably got that Calypso style going in there. Yeah, yeah. So he's used to that, you know. So, um, my guitar player, because when Prince Buster came up, when Laurel brought up, Laurel brought up Prince Buster. Yeah. And uh, when he came up, we, was, we practiced all the songs from um, Prince Buster. But the old scar songs, them and so on, really. And when Prince Buster came up with Linted, he said it was, no man is not scar anymore, no, no. Like steady. Steady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 24 hours, we got to change the program. <laughs> if we didn't have Linted there, it would yes. be a catastrophe, man. And Linted, Linted get down, and the hours down, say, no, no, you play. And quick, 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 quick. And we get it going, you know. We, but it was, and we play some Al Capone, don't, don't argue, and all the Ten Commandments of Men. And yeah. watch us. That's the only three songs what we practice we, we get played by uh, Buster put in the program. Yeah. Otherwise, it was all rock steady. <laughs> uh, and um, Larry was a bit disappointed because he said, uh, you want to go up, you play the songs with the people, but they want to play the songs with the people they want. This rock steady business, the people they don't know it. <laughs> You people in the know it's too slow for the teenager then. <laughs> <laughs> they just too slow. We see all the scars and the people want because it's faster. He, he was very annoyed with Prince Bu um, Laurel with Prince Buster. You suppose the play, you don't see a concert, they now go down good. They now go down good because the people is too rock steady and know it is too new. What after the scars and them? The Prince Buster have to. Do, do, uh, we couldn't go back to doing other stuff because we didn't, you know, um, Lin Tate said uh, a Prince was very strict, he's very stubborn. He is very stubborn. <laughs> he still wanted to do the rock steady stuff when he young, because this way we're moving on to the white crowd. Yes. Because many, many years ago when I was with Prince, when I was with Laurel, we was in the white crowd. Yeah. After Prince Bust, the tour was finished, we get into the white crowd. Yeah. You see? And the young kids, they, 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 the mugs and the skins and so on, you know, they, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't, don't understand the rock thing. No, it's different, but they yeah. didn't understand it, you know? Yeah, of course, yeah. It was hard, it was hard, very hard, but Lin Tate was there to help us and, you know, it take, it, it, the sound of the guitar, it takes over. It makes it so loud that you only hear him. <laughs> and, you know, and the drummer have to follow him and it was okay, it went, it went all right, but, he didn't have such a success, Prince Buster, on the tour, because he changed his program. Yeah. Wash Wash went on well, because that was in the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, that was a hit, big hit for Prince Buster. Yeah. And that went on well. And Wash Wash went on well, and the other one, um, uh, the, uh, the other one, Wash Wash, Ten Commandments of Men, and uh, Al Capone, Guns Don't Argue, that went on good too. Yeah. This one. But all the other songs then, the rock steady stuff them didn't work. Yeah. But but Laurel was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did one concert with Prince Buster. Check this out. And when we do over 45 minutes, uh, um before the show, uh, Laurel, you know, he was the promoter. Um <laughs> and then all of a sudden things start going wrong with Prince Buster show. And we got one of those revolving stage. I don't know if you remember those stage, those yeah. days. Yeah. You know, it, one band started to play, the other one keep yeah. going rolling. <laughs> and so the Prince Buster started playing, people started kind of not accepting it, not accepting the the, the program from Prince Buster. There was a shout out, turn him wrong, turn him wrong. Come way around. Keep that walk out of the place, turn him wrong. <laughs> and then the band started, take off Prince Buster because the people started getting weary. Yeah. They were getting weird because they don't understand this rock steady. Yeah, yeah. They didn't understand it. Yeah. And Larry shout out. I'm telling you, Larry, he's very direct. He couldn't care if you're a star or not. 
Turn him on. People are getting weary. And the other man start to play. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's a, you know. So you don't have to stages anymore then, the revolving stages. You don't have to stage no more, huh? I, I, I remember, I, Lola, Lola had a great way of making you feel special. He'd it, 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 always play the band one by one. He'd go, yeah, get sick. And walk in. I was on key. Stan, uh, I'm giving you a little extra, but don't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but he said that to everybody. You know, we're going to the movie on the way. No one would say anything, and then someone would go, "How much did you get?" So, and they'd lie as well. We'd all go, oh, mm-hmm. "Regular amount, yeah, yeah." And so <laughs> they'd talk. Well, I got a little bit extra. And this one, well, so did I. <laughs> and then we worked out that. All he did was he did that, and he made you feel like, yeah, I'm special. He yeah, loves yeah, yeah, yeah. He did that with us too. I'll he see that you that tomorrow. He did that with us too. No much, no much people. You know, the, most of the people who come in, you know, they come in almost free, you know, not good business tonight and so on and whatever. But you know, but but you still could go to and borrow something from him, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's good that way. I remember one time. We were talking to him and said, me, me no care what I'm, 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 I'm got dead. Me, girl, me have to have a hit record. Me, girl, have a hit record. And I said, well, if Lara is saying that, it's, it's, I don't know how he did it. And in the end, it did have a hit record. I remember he said to us, even if me have to walk in the chart, <laughs> even if me have to walk in the chart, I got a hit record in the, in the chart. Yeah. What record you had in the chart in the end? Um, um Rudy got married, right? Got married, yeah. Rudy got married. That is in the chart. So it, this is if it did never have a record in the chart, they even, even when we have to walk in it. It's it's funny because um there's some the song is it absolute the beginning of the film that Lowell's got landlords and tenants is in the film. Well, yeah, yeah. absolute beginners, yeah. That's yeah, right. But not, but yeah, but it's not on the soundtrack. Yeah. Oh I yeah, know, which is you know, you think, how unlucky could you be? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's hard to think, you know. I always think, because I, I bought the soundtrack thinking, yeah, I'll see low. It's just not on it. No, it's not. It's disappointing. Yeah. But it's in the film. I'm going to play Laurel singing some Mento from the 50s. Wow. Because uh, 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 why not? Here we go. Why not? If it, if it can play. Play. I'm using an old computer and it. it's a bit slow. Sorry about this, guys. So, what, no, no vinyl, Mark? Ah, uh, oh, well, not not in this room. Uh, <laughs> not in this room. Play? Oh, it won't play. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, I have to keep ramping it. Okay. But I think the point I was trying to make really was that. Um, here we go. There we go. Oh, Even in a time before Scar. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that was a bad king. Yeah. Yeah. The car only started in 63-62, Mike. Mark, that's what the car started. Yeah. That's what I know from Larry of the boy in Jamaica. These are the songs we used to sing. Yes, yeah, it's real early. Scar with Laurel, isn't it? That, from that album. Yeah. That's that. I love that. Yeah. 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 Amazing. We'll have a little bit. You, Roy mentioned this cut. This is Bad to Kill Me Go. Yeah. Should we go again? I love that beginning of it. Yeah. Yeah. Make good fun of life. This is not what I know. His oh, voice then as well was so high, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. So distinctive voice. <laughs> Good thing with Larry now, because he was grown up in Jamaica and was born in Cuba. I think he came to Jamaica when old was he? Um, 
about seven, I think. Yeah. And because my then father Jamaica, uh, Cubans and so on, we still have that cue. If we listen to the stuff, it's, uh, it's still have that a little bit of the Cuban touch yeah. in his music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, you know. So for him, and when we come in, when we used to back him, he used to play sing a lot of Spanish songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me mucho, uh, uh, La Bamba, and some other ones I can't remember. You know. But as I say, when you play Calypso songs, I mean, in Jamaica, those days, a little boy, when you used to hear them songs on the radio, you can hear that Cuban touch inside of it, you know? The yep. men to suck them and so on. Guys. Yeah. Well, when, I just wanted to, on that tip, because uh, that's part of his heritage, you know, yeah. the, 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 the Cuban side, the Spanish side, and yeah. the Spanish playing as Lorenzo. Um, yeah. When he got sick, we did a benefit gig for him, and Club Scar made a little video, uh, which we uh, sold, and all the money went to went to Laurel. But I, ju I just want to share this because it was very yeah, good of it. Yeah, so yeah. I, I said to Steve, um, "Okay, I know, you know I really want you to sing on this show, but I want you to do something you've never done before." And um, I, 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 he said, "Well, what do you want?" And I said, uh, "Well, you used to live in Colombia." You used to speak Spanish, so why don't we do quizazz or perhaps, but we'll do it in Spanish. And Steve went away and polished up his Spanish because it had been a few years, and he came back and 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 uh, for me it was one of the nicest things of the night. And of course, then Laurel's later when he got well a bit after the show, um, he's looking at Steve and Steve's doing the singing and and it's in Spanish, you know, wow. And the Spanish connection was obviously very important because Roy um, is, is, you know, now works with a record company. Yeah, uh, Madrid, so, doing, and yeah. a good friend of, of Laurel. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, then, um, I've had a message from Cherry Red Records. They are very grateful to us for the time that we've dedicated to this today to talk about our great friend and hero of music, um, Laurel Aiken. Yeah. Uh, on my yeah. part, I want to thank you all. And I uh, hope the people. It's a that pleasure are doing it, Mark. Gonna hear yeah. this. So, yeah, um, Let's break the monotony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the Godfather of Scar, Laurel Aiken, we'll never forget him. Gentlemen, never, 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 never. for everyone. Uh, for Laurel. Good to see you all. Take care, yeah. everybody. Where I am today, with all Laurel Aiken, I would never leave yeah, Switzerland. Care, yes. <laughs> Switzerland from France, yeah. from West London. All over the place, you know. Leicester. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thanks, man. All right, guys. Yeah, everybody. Hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Oh, see you all on this day. See you all on this day. Oh, freedom.